Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome everyone to another episode in our grief series. As you know, I not only share stories from our guests who have overcome major challenges in their lives, I also like to introduce you to different forms of modalities that I believe could be helpful in supporting us as we go through many of these. So today, I'm delighted to be delving into one such modality called hypnotherapy and how it can help with anxiety, depression, and much more. Our guest is Mike Oglesby. He's an acclaimed author and coach who has taught everyone from kids to adults in their 90s overcome mental struggles and become their best selves. Mike's first book is called Fight Back, End the Cycles of Anxiety and Depression. And his second book, which will be released later on this year, is called Bigger Than Fear. You may have seen Mike uh, before, if you go onto the YouTube channel, which we've just started. Uh, you may have seen him before on TV or heard him on radio shows. And he's now breaking into guesting on podcasts, hence why he's with us. So before we go any further, let me welcome Mike to the show. Hi, Mike. Hi, Anne. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to talk with you and uh, get into some deep subjects and and really talk about things that people are going through and, and how we can best assist them in our work. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh, somebody from 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 deep within my own heart, because as you know, I'm passionate about all of this. Before we go deep, why don't we just skim the surface? What is hypnotherapy and what brought you to this work? Hypnotherapy is very misunderstood. And I often, I, I've found throughout my journey uh, over the past almost 13 years, uh, really teaching people about what hypnotherapy is and mm. really what it's not. And, and because, you know, you watch TV and you hear about these shows and these ideas about, oh, you know, I'm going to control you, make you bark like a dog and cluck like a chicken, things like that. And, you know, however, those things are, you know, happening. Those things are real. That's what we call stage hypnosis. It's a form of entertainment. So when we talk about hypnotherapy, if you notice the word is hypno therapy it's it's a mm -hmm. combination of hypnosis mixed with a therapeutic modality mm. and so we combine that because hypnosis the the primary uh, reason for using that is to get into the subconscious mind oh. now the subconscious mind is the dominant part of who we are it represents about 95% of the mind in total Mm. And that's where our belief systems reside, which everything stems from our belief systems. What you believe about yourself, what you believe about the world, and the things that you interact with, that determines how you think and feel about them. And so when we talk about change in our life, mm. we have to change it at that deepest fundamental level. And mm. hypnotherapy is a tool that works toward creating that change for people. It's a very powerful tool uh, to help us change those fundamental settings so that we can experience ourselves and life differently. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind when you were talking about that? You mentioned the word change. Now, we are humans. We have survived up until now. But with this very ancient part of us, 
that is primed to perceive threats, isn't it? So when you introduce change, (laughs) that alerts the system, doesn't it? So I can only imagine by going into the unconscious, you're bypassing that. Is, Is that correct? Well, in a sense, yes, you know, we're acting upon those impulses that come from the subconscious mind. And it's really interesting because we tend to think of change or perceive change as a threat. But the just like you mentioned, we've made it all of these thousands of years because of change. Now, mm-hmm. if you really think about it, you know, I've, I've really thought about, you know, what qualities, what characteristics, what traits you know, could we cultivate most dominantly within us that would help us the most in life? And I've thought about this. I said, you know, the the character trait that would ensure your survival anywhere, just about, and mm-hmm. through anything is the trait of adaptability. The ability mm-hmm. to adapt is nothing more than being able to change more easily. So change is necessary for our survival. But, you know, we don't live in those ancient times where we're really surrounded by those threats, not to the degree that we have been. I mean, we live in a very peaceful time, even though it's still a lot of, you know, turmoil going on. We do live in one of the most peaceful times in the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so really now it's about not really how can I survive? But how can I thrive? Mm -hmm. And if you're unwilling to change and embrace change, change is not a bad thing. I mean, we tend to think that change is what we struggle with, but it's not really change that we struggle with. It's letting go of the things Uh that prevent the the change from happening. Now, that's, that's the struggle. That's the real struggle. And it's important that we notice that because if we believe or have this idea that we struggle so much with change, then we start tying that idea to change. But it's not change we struggle with. I mean, you change your clothes every day. You change what you're doing every day. You change your conversations. You, you change a lot of things every day without a second thought, without any struggle. So if change is what created the struggle, well, then you would struggle with change. And it's not really that. It's we learn to identify with these things and we we rely on these things, even the dysfunctions of our life. We rely on that to remind us, if you will, to to uh, strengthen our association to our identity. And so we have a real difficult time letting that go. Even if it's painful, it's certain it's known. It's something we can rely on. And that's a lot easier to deal with than uncertainty. So it's not necessarily the change per se. It's the uncertainty that change can potentially bring to us. Yes. Because of all the fear attached to that. I mean, like, you know, when you know how something's going to go, well, I mean, it's a safe bet. Yeah. You know, And, and you can rely on that. And so, you know, when that fear kicks in of the uncertainty, we don't know what to do. And that's mm-hmm. hard. That's yeah. hard. I mean, you see this in your grief counseling. You know, this is this is the uncertainty, that construct that was created in the minds of these people going through these transitions has broken down. It no mm-hmm. longer works. It, it, it doesn't. It's incongruent with reality. And so now they don't know what to do. And so there's all these, you know, emotional disturbances and debilitations because of the uncertainty. So we would rather stay in a certain state of pain that we can rely on Mm -hmm. than to step into the uncertainty with the possibility of greater levels of joy and happiness and thriving. Mm. It's silly, but it's what we do. (laughs) Well, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) it is. Uh, I'm just sort of thinking of what you just said there. It's almost as if we want to stay in the pain because that pain represents either the person or the thing that we have lost because that was certain. Yes. If we let go of it, then I guess that's where the fear and the anxiety of the unknown kind of creep in, eh? 
Yeah. And and when you really think about the reality of that, the very statement you just made, you know, to let go of it. Well, what is it that we're letting go of? Yeah. It's not the person. You're not letting go of the thing. I mean, you don't have a person to let go of. I mean, yeah. you don't own a single thing. You know, your your house was owned by someone before you, or if it wasn't, it'll be owned by someone after you. You know, you don't have things. You know, I often mm. say we're not here to experience having things. We're here to have the experience of life, right? Things are going to come. Things are going to go. And we have such a hard time with letting go. But, you know, one day, one day we don't have a choice. I mean, mm-hmm. when it comes to that transition that we all go through, which is not a bad thing, we tend to look at that transition as if it's bad or it's tragic or, you know, it's wrong or, you know, there's a problem with it. But there's not. That's, you know, you can't live without death, right? Exactly. And you can't die had you not lived. And it's just a part of the process. It's, and it's a beautiful part of the process. We go through it every year. We call it winter, right? That's <laughs> that's the seasons. That's That's the transitions of life. It's not a bad thing. It's not a terrible thing. It's not a tragic thing. Yeah. It's a normal thing thing. It's a part of life. And so what we're really letting go of instead of the external things is we're letting go of the idea. That's it. That's simple all you have. That. Letting go of it's not the easy, ideas. But it's yeah. yeah. So when I mentioned letting go of it, letting go of the grief, letting go of the, it's letting go of the ideas then. Yeah. Because that's all you have. Yeah. You know, when you when you say, okay, letting go of this thing, right? The thing only has the meaning you've given it anyways. Yes. It's the yeah. ideas that you've attached to the externals. It's never the externals. That's exactly. why it's unique to you. Yeah. Right? It's it's ideas. It's all mental. We are only playing a mental game that is then physically expressed, but it's a mental game. Period. And so when you can go in there and you can change those mental constructs, it changes your physical life. It changes the whole experience of life. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful experience that we can create. Exactly. So why do people go on year after year and they'll say, I'm never going to get over this grief. I'm never going to get over it. I'm going to be like this. You know, this is it. What is the, what's the belief then going on in their minds when they, they have that outlook? I think it can change and vary from person to person. But the first Mm -hmm. thing we have to do is we got to let go of that story. I mean, if okay. you're going to hold on to the story, it's going to reinforce the results. I mean, we're, we're living out the stories we play out in our heads, you know, and if you have a belief that you cannot, I mean, really think about this, you know, when let's say someone has lost their spouse. Okay. And these are hard things. I mean, the grief yeah. process is a very normal, natural experience for the human race. It just mm-hmm. is. And, and that's nothing to be afraid of. That's something to be embraced because that's part of being a human. And that's a beautiful yeah. thing, but it's not easy. But life isn't really that easy. It's full of challenges and struggles. And, you know, it's it's full of lessons. But let's say a spouse loses their partner. There is some idea that they are incapable of living without this person. I mean, think about how disempowered that is to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Right? And even though they, they're they they're negating the reality of their experience, let's say they've been married for 60 years. That's a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, most likely they're in their 80s. Yeah. Right? Because they probably didn't meet until they were in their 20s. But if you take that idea, I cannot live without this person. Wow, what a debilitating idea that is to begin with. Yeah. But you live for 20 some years without this person. I mean, to 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 negate and and really step aside from the truth that your life isn't dependent upon another yeah. person. Mm. Right? You're struggling and that's it, it's an inability to to deal with the situation. But the beautiful thing about us as humans is we can learn. Yeah. Right? 
You learn to live with that person. You learned to love that person. You learn to become dependent in certain ways on that person. You can also learn to live without them. And not only that, we tend to, on the other side of the transition, hold on to all the things that feel bad. Yeah. But it comes at all the expense of, of the things that feel good. And we want to honor the memory of people. We don't want to just, we don't want their memory to be painful. We want, we want to remember the good times. We want to be able to sit in that. We want to be able to embrace that because that's a gift. You didn't lose that person. You gained all that experience with them. And again, that's that's a hard, that's a hard thing to really take in when you're going through it. Oh, but absolutely. with the right type of help and the right type of support, you can get to that place. There's always, there's always a way. And if there wasn't, then people wouldn't do it. People do it. <laughs> exactly. So it's the stories then is what I'm understanding. It's the stories yeah. that we tell ourselves. Absolutely. And and the longer we reinforce a story, the mm. the stronger that story becomes to us, the more part of our identity it becomes. And your identity is going to decide everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Okay. We did go deep pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Thank you. And I hope that's given the listeners a deeper perspective of the grieving process. If somebody were to come to you and they're really, really struggling, is hypnotherapy something that you would take them through to sort of, would it ease their pain? Like, what is it you're doing in those in those moments? So it definitely can be a very powerful tool. I mean, hypnotherapy is the strongest psychology for the subconscious mind because, uh, you know, the whole point of hypnotherapy is to go past the conscious mind, to get it out of the way. And we tend mm -hmm. to think about it going into hypnosis as like a state of sleep. And when we go into a state of sleep, that conscious mind disconnects. So it's out of the way. We can go directly to these fundamental systems that create the constructs in our minds and we can, you know, basically present different stories. That's really what it boils down to, right? The reprogramming okay. part, uh, portion of that. We're presenting new stories in the form of, you know, new associations, new mm -hmm. directives, not commands. They're not demands. They're just suggestions, right? Okay. And so when those suggestions kind of go deep like that, then they kind of bring to the conscious awareness the effect of them. And, and when we've got that in the consciousness, the, that's what we act upon. And so as we act upon those new ideas, we reinforce those new ideas. So it's cyclical. It just kind of kind of goes in a circle. So if we're, re, if we're acting on those new ideas, those new you know, stories, if you will, that mm -hmm. we're putting in, that reinforces them into the subconscious mind, and that serves to establish them as part of the fundamental belief systems. Now, not everyone is open to hypnotherapy. And so in that case, I work with the conscious mind. Now, even though the conscious mind is roughly 5%, it still contains our most powerful attribute. And that mm -hmm. is free will, choice. Right. And this is why, you know, you can be your best coach or you can be your worst enemy because you have the power to, to choose. You can sabotage yourself or you can make choices that are in alignment with what you want and who you want to be in life. So, yeah. you know, aside from the hypnotherapy aspect, I do a lot of work with the conscious mind, mm -hmm. retraining it, teaching people how to use their conscious mind in a more effective way, you know, mm -hmm. teaching them how to think more effectively. I mean, consider this. We'll set a goal for ourselves. Yeah. And then we'll do things that aren't in alignment with that goal. And we don't think twice about it. And we wonder why we're not reaching our goals. And so what we want to do is we want to decide, okay, and th this is the beauty of change. Change is not happenstance. It's not by circumstance. It's not a fluke thing. It's not by luck. It's by choice. You can change your life in almost any way that you want. And you can have almost anything that you want in life, but it all begins with choice. It's not mm -hmm. chance, it's choice. choice. What a beautiful thing. 
right? Yeah. But most people don't see it that way. They think of it as, oh, well, that person's lucky. Oh, well, they got a mm-hmm. break. Oh, no. uh-huh. they made choices that took them to what you see as a break was just a normal part of their path. And so if we can choose an outcome that we would like, we don't have to know how we're going to get there. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's the beautiful thing about change. And you're not typically going to know how you're going to get where you want to go. I mean, you don't know anything. Yeah. You know yeah. the past, but the past yeah. doesn't exist. It's over. You can't find it. Right. You can look for evidence of your stories of how things happened and what things happened, but you can't prove any of it. All you can, all you know is what's now. I mean, you don't know what you're going to think in five seconds, five minutes, five hours, five days, five, you know nothing of the future. And that's the reality of life. And you've never known the future. You never had to know the future in order to adequately step into it and do the things that you want. So as long as we can create, uh, you know, decide, if you will, on what we're looking for. Mm. Then we can step into the process of aligning ourselves completely with that outcome. And that means okay. our thinking, our emotions, which your emotions come from your thinking. For example, mm-hmm. if you think of a happy thought, you feel happy. Yeah. When you think of a sad thought, you feel sad. If you think of a an anxious thought, you're going to feel anxious. Or a depressive thought, you're going to feel depressed. So your emotions, I often say emotion stands for energy in motion, Mm -hmm. is your body's response to your thoughts. So people that are stuck in that grieving pattern, it's Mm -hmm. because they're stuck in that thinking pattern, right? And so if we can start to align that along with our actions, if we can make everything congruent, then we can get to our goals. Right. But we're typically incongruent in one or more of those places. Mm -hmm. So our desire isn't reinforced. So therefore, it's not created. But if we can bring into an alignment our full selves, then we can pretty much get whatever we want in life to a degree. I mean, we're limited in our physicality. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to jump off of a building and fly without some apparatus. We don't want to (laughs) be. I mean, and nobody really has uh, the desire to do that. Some people, they like to, you know, they like the challenges. Say, oh, I can't go to the moon. I'm I'm like, well, yeah, you can. If you had a ride, you could. I mean, it's it's not that it's an impossibility. It's Mm -hmm. it's an improbability, but it's not an impossibility. But the things that you truly desire in life, you're able to achieve all of those things. But there's also a level of discernment to understand what you truly desire. We tend to get sidetracked. And we focus on the vehicle that we think is going to take us to what we desire. For example, you know, someone wants money and they start focusing all their energy and all their effort on money. Well, okay, well, what do you want the money for? What's your real motive? Money is nothing more than a vehicle to get you what you want. And it may be the vehicle, but it only may be a piece of the vehicle. So if we can focus on what it is we truly desire and align with that, and then let life bring to us all the different pieces that need to be put together to create that puzzle, then we can have just about anything we want. It's a beautiful, and it's a beautiful unfolding, truly is beautiful. Yeah, if we just get out out of our own way and allow it, eh? rather than trying to hold tight and control it. Okay. (laughs) That was a lot. Let me see if I can unpack it. I love how you said our emotions come from our thoughts. And it's something I teach my uh, grief clients. Um, I don't need a slide. I'll just describe. Imagine this hippo floating with a magic wand. Just see it with a pink tutu on. Just, Just visualize it. And you can usually, like you, you you visualized it and it brings a smile. All right, shake that off. And let's say out of the corner of your eye, you see this black something or other moving. You focus on it. It's a black tarantula and it's coming closer to your legs. Yeah, I've had people even almost get up on the seat (laughs) when I would do that at workshops. But that's the power. I didn't have a slide. I just described. 
yeah. pretty vividly the situation. But that gives them the idea of how strong and powerful the mind can grapple onto something like that, isn't it? Oh, yes. You know, I often say we live in a world of imagination expressed. Mm. Everything, every single thing created by humankind was birthed through the imagination mm -hmm. of humankind. In other words, it's all made up. All the rules, all the laws, the schools, the things, the, the microphones, the computers, everything that we're interacting with that was made by humans was all made up. We live in a world of make-believe. We really do. Everything came from the, the mind. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And if we have that power, and we tend to rely on other people's minds, because mm. we don't want to do the work ourselves, do we? Because that work <laughs> takes effort. And a lot of people just and don't like to put And what if I fail? <laughs> well, you know, you. I mean, when you think about failure, okay, and, and, and this is one of those, the, the beautiful things about choice, is we get to decide what things mean to us. Mm. I mean, there's nothing in life that has a set meaning. That's why people experience things differently in life, yeah. because we get to choose that. So when it comes to failure, if you really want to be successful, you have to, you have to embrace failure because it's part of the process of becoming successful. And, and successful mm -hmm. can mean anything that you decide it means, but yeah. failure is not a bad thing. And so it's like, okay, I'm not going to get started because I might fail. Well, let's say you did get started and you failed. Well, you'd be in the same place as never getting started, which means if you never get started, you fail. You're in the it's same place. That, yeah, it's as easy as that. Yeah. Something else I want to just kind of glide back to. Um, we're, we're unable to create our future. What happens, though, if you've had events that have made you who you are and you've got past experience? So that makes you fearful for wanting to try something new. But you it's almost like you're bringing the past into the now and into the future. Yes. Yes. How and would that's you work often with that? what happens. Okay. Well, your past is your only point of reference that you, yeah. you have certainty over. Okay. Right? But we're still just dealing with thoughts and ideas. We're not dealing with reality. Mm. But here's the thing. Your thoughts become your realities, right? It's called a, a personality, which stands for personal reality, right? Okay. And the way that you think and act on that, it's like, I mean, that the the whole journey you just described is nothing more than avoiding fear and overcompensating for it by trying to avoid it. Now, have mm. you ever heard of someone getting rid of a fear by avoiding it? No, you have to face it. Doesn't it doesn't happen. That's face the only fears. way that you can. <laughs> and not only that, <clears throat> when you think about it, okay, things are going to happen in life. Mm-hmm. To think things aren't going to happen in life to you that are tough, that are painful. Well, that's unrealistic, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Life can be painful. Right? And so we must come up with new philosophies, new foundational principles, if you will, that will allow us to embrace the challenges of life. And we tend to think, and, and this to me is kind of, it's silly and it's it's a bit comical to me. When someone makes plans and they get all, you know, flustered when life throws a monkey wrench in their plans and they're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this happened. And I'm thinking to myself, how could you not believe that this happened? This has happened to you your whole life. Mm. This is what life does. You, you don't just come to life and get what you want. 
That's not what life is about. Life mm -hmm. would be boring if you just got everything that you want and there was no challenge to anything. It'd be boring, right? We like the challenges, mm -hmm. but we just haven't learned to understand them. We haven't yeah. learned to understand pain. We haven't learned how to understand life and the system and how it works. And so it really is beneficial to create fundamental, foundational principles and philosophies to live our life on. And I'll give you one that has truly changed my life in uh, so many ways. And it, and it changes the whole game. And that is everything in life is a gift. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is. I don't care how bad it seems to be. Everything in life is a gift. I truly believe that life has only one objective, and that is to give us the desires of our heart, not our mm -hmm. surface desires. Oh, I really want that car. Oh, I want that mm -hmm. person. Oh, I want that toy. No, I'm talking about the true motives, the things that truly drive us. And that's an individual thing. Mm -hmm. And I believe that life does everything, gives us every opportunity to step into that, to experience that, to, to really have, be, and do those things. Mm -hmm. And so when you take a foundational principle like that and you incorporate it, what you begin to do from that, right? You've got that belief now, right? And that yeah. belief is going to create those thoughts of, okay, well, this is a gift. All right, well, well what is the gift in this? Mm -hmm. hmm. And then we start seeking the gift in all things in life. Yeah. And it does look, I've been through some really tough things. I, I've experienced death of people, not really, really close to me. Um, I mean, some family members, but never lost mm -hmm. a spouse. Um, mm -hmm. But I've been estranged. So I've lost some very close loved ones. Um, I've lost a lot of things in life. In fact, all of my growth I can I can really pinpoint there's a loss of something. Yeah. Right? But yeah. the loss when it becomes a gift is not something that subtracts from your life. It's something that expands you. Mm -hmm. Right? When you go through even though it's a tough situation or a tough mm -hmm. circumstance, you become stronger. You become bigger, you become better, but only if you use it as a gift. And so it's like saying everything in life contains a gift. But see, we have to do our part. Mm -hmm. It's our job to find the gift in everything in life. Yeah. And when you find the gift in everything in life, it becomes something that you can utilize, something that makes you better. And when you get better, life gets better. Yes. Yeah. I and like so, to say find the gift or opportunity in whatever is coming your way. Yes. Sorry, I cut you off. I was just so excited. Oh, no, no. no. I, you're, very, you're very, that's it. It, it. Just like that. Find the gift. And what do we call that? A growth-oriented mindset. And so mm. you use anything and everything to help you grow, to help you become more, to help you become better. Even when you lose someone, so we say we lose someone, you don't, you don't ever lose a person. You just, it just changes. That's why it's called yeah. a transition. You shift into a different reality where they're just not physically here. But that doesn't detract from you. It doesn't take away from you because you're still all of you that you were before they were no longer with you, right? Yeah. But that yeah. experience can expand you. Now, let's say, Someone goes through this transition uh, or their partner goes through the transition and let's say they're fairly young, maybe they're 40s, 50s, maybe 60s, and they work through that, right? They go through a, a productive grieving process and that's important. Mm -hmm. If you're going to grieve, yeah. you know, the people that grieve for years, it's because they're not productively grieving. There's a way mm -hmm. to productively grieve, right? To move through that stuff, not to get caught in it. Yeah. They may be able to take that and their experience of going through it, and they may be able to go out and help so many other people with it. There's a gift in that. Mm -hmm. There's always a gift in everything. I don't care what it is. Now, people will challenge it with, you know, all kinds of crazy things, extreme things. But I choose to believe that everything that I go through in life, first and foremost, is for me 
that's not happening to me. It's yeah. for me because life is yeah. only trying to help me, right? And if, if life was trying to hurt me, well, that would go against itself. I am mm-hmm. life expressed, mm-hmm. right? And Beautiful. so life isn't going to hurt itself. Life, it, 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 you know, if you look around and you look at the constants, life is constantly evolving, which evolution is a process of expansion. And so it's always looking to expand and evolve me. And so it, it's going to give me everything that I need that is personal to me so that it can achieve that objective so that I can achieve that objective. And when you look at life through that lens, then you start experiencing life in that way. Yeah. Because what a beautiful, a, sorry, I'm inter- That's a, what was you, you were going to finish your sentence. That's the story. That's the story that I hold. Therefore, yeah. it's the story that I experienced. Now, is it true? Doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. what is true, right? It doesn't matter if it's true. It matters if it's helpful. Yeah. That's exactly. all that matters. And it is helpful. I just wanted to thank you because to me, if anybody is listening to this, you've given a beautiful roadmap on how we can deal with some of the challenges. It doesn't always have to be the death of somebody, does it? It can be a number of things and won't go into them because I speak readily on all of them um, throughout the, the podcast. Coming back to... You you alluded to the fact that you are familiar with grief. You were estranged. Is that what brought you to the work? Was in those those moments when you were going mm. through? I've lived a life of governed by fear, uh, which you know, fear. We tend to think of fear as like you know being afraid of something. Uh, like, oh, there's a spider, you know, like the tarantula or a snake <laughs> or something. But fear expresses itself in many different ways. Um, and a few of those primary ways that I experienced it was anxiety. And not just, you know, regular, you know, anxiety here and there. I'm talking debilitating anxiety, panic attacks. And I've even hallucinated you know, from extreme anxiety, mm. uh, depression, suicidal ideation, OCD. I had trichotillomania, which is a hair pulling disorder. Yes. Uh, yes. Just so many things, so much dysfunction throughout my whole life. And life, it just sucked. I hated living life. I mean, I hated living life. That's mm. so sad. Yeah. And I always, I was always searching for something, because mm-hmm. I always knew there was someone inside of me. I always knew there was greatness, if you will, inside of me. I just couldn't figure out how to open up and come out and play, you know, and yeah. uh, life was just a struggle. And I think, you know, my journey of of searching and seeking, you know, to feel better is what led me into this, which then turned into helping other people feel better uh, as a way to mitigate my own pain. Because it gave me some purpose, uh, okay. which then led me to my own healing. So now I don't, I don't suffer with any type of debilitating anxiety, uh, any depression. There's no suicidal ideation. There's no OCD. It's it's gone. I healed myself, but but my pain and my suffering. And so, you know, you know that goes back to starting to realize that everything in life is a gift, okay. and going through it. That was life shaping me molding me, which is a a hard process, Mm -hmm. refining me into the man that I am today. But I wouldn't be where I'm at. I wouldn't be able to relate to people. I wouldn't be able to help people the way that I do without having the experiences that I've had. They were my gifts. I just didn't Mm. understand them. Yeah. So understanding is a very important part of the process, teaching people to understand themselves in life in a very different way, one that gives it meaning and one that gives it purpose and one that makes everything in life that they go through beneficial to work towards a greater end. Mm -hmm. Did you do all this through searching and reading and learning or did you have help along the way? I kind of did it on my own for the most part. Yeah. Now, there were motivational speakers and teachers that uh, I took on as my mentors. 
I never met them, didn't know them, you know, but I had YouTube and I had other, you know, avenues to listen to them. And I listened to them every single day. And I just pushed that stuff inside of me and uh, as much as I could. And, you know, it took years for me. It took Mm -hmm. years. And, you know, a lot of people and I, I remember, you know, always hearing people say, well, you know, most people give up. You know, like a seed planted in the ground, they give up right before it's about to break ground. Yeah, yeah. And I've, there were so many times that I just wanted to give up. And Mm. I always thought to myself, I hear you guys saying that, you all say that, but I've been doing this for years. Where's my breakthrough? This isn't real. This isn't going to happen. It doesn't happen for people like me and da 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 da, Mm. you know, the victim mentality. Yeah. You know, that was my identity, you know, and, um, and then it happened mm. and then it happened. And, and, and now I understand, but it takes, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of strength and it takes a lot of consistency. But if you can combine those and be steadfast on your journey and mm-hmm. keep looking forward, you will get there. Mm-hmm. You will get there. It just happens. It's not a individual thing, you know, everybody else, you know, I had this idea that, you know, everything worked for everybody else, but nothing really works for me. Wouldn't work for you. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't until I, you know, was able to shed that identity and take on a new one, that things Mm. started to shift. And and that's when I really learned the importance of not just doing something different, because I did a lot of different things, and I would feel better for a little while, but then I'd go right back to feeling the way that I was and doing the things that I did before. And through that journey, I learned that it's not about what you do necessarily. It takes the doing. Nothing's really going to happen unless you do something different. But the real key is you have to become someone different. Okay. Right? And yeah. so it's not just that I don't have anxiety or depression or OCD, or suicidal ideation, the reality is I'm not the person that I was. I'm not a person who has that. I'm not a person Mm -hmm. who lives with that. When before, I was a person who lived with that. I'm a very different person now. And, And that version of me can't even stand in the shadow of the man that I've become. And it's a growth oriented process. If okay. you if you want to like the grief, that's a process of growth and getting to the other side of that in a healthy way. That's a process of growth. Mm-hmm. It's not just doing something different. It's becoming something different and allowing that experience to refine you, mm-hmm. to help you become greater than you were before, because you can. Yeah. It's all up to the stories and how you choose to be in life. As you said, you chose to give up that identity of of victimhood. Yes. That was the person that had all those things. And now this new identity, you don't have any of them. That's right. Beautiful. That's right. So for somebody who may be listening and has anxiety or even depression, I've heard, what would you say to somebody who's had a spell? Because it seems to come, they don't live in depression. It, it's not all ongoing. It's sort of like it's a spell and then they come out of it and life is good. But then all of a sudden they go back into it. What might be going on there, Mike? So when you have someone with the recurring cycles, the first thing we have to do, and I think the the first step to really changing your life it comes through acceptance. Okay. And accepting that if you have those recurring cycles, you have mental health issues. Now, that doesn't sound pretty, but it's not a bad thing. Most people have mental health issues, whether they recognize that or accept that or or or, or choose to believe that. And And so when you... When you just absorb that, when you just sit with that and you say, look, okay, I have mental health issues. Okay. I've had mental health issues my whole life. Okay. So if I have mental health issues, 
what would be the most effective choice or decision that I can make from that place? Well, I probably need to make my mental health one of my top two to three priorities. Mm -hmm. And getting better is not a matter of feeling better. It's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting better is a matter of changing. And that takes time. So you can get into a new program. You can become sidetracked. Like, like you said, it kind of runs in waves. Like, oh, I'm feeling depressed today, but tomorrow I may not feel depressed. Okay, well, if you don't feel depressed, you're probably not going to do anything about your depression, mm. which means in a few weeks, you're going to start feeling depressed again. And you're going to go back into the cycle. You're going to start beating yourself up again. You're going to start reinforcing those patterns, those neural pathways. If you have mental health issues, Recognize that you have mental health issues and make your mental health one of your top priorities. Mm -hmm. It does not matter if you feel good or bad that day. Your mental health needs to be one of your top priorities. And when you start making your mental health your one of your top priorities, then you start doing things every day to make sure that you have a healthy mental state. And making those choices, and this is the beautiful thing about choice, and I'm going to make this statement, but, you know, and, and it'll, it might throw some people back, but, but give me a moment to clarify what I mean by this. Anxiety and depression are choices. They are choices. Now, it does not mean that you're choosing to have anxiety. You're choosing to feel depression. It's not that. It just means that these things are propelled by the choices that you consistently make. And mm. if you start making choices that change your brain and change your state of mental health, if you make them consistently and long enough, you won't have anxiety and depression to deal with every day. Therefore, it is a product of our choices. But we've been taught to be anxious. We've been taught to be depressed. These are states of mind, right? Mm -hmm. When you think of something that you're anxious about, that's a negative future-based mindset. It comes from negative ideas of the future. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if they do this? Mm -hmm. What if they don't do this? Mm -hmm. It's all from the negative ideas of the future, which is made up because guess what? The future doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. You've yeah. only ever experienced the now, ever. You've only ever experienced it now. When you say, oh, I, well, I experienced the past only when it was present. Mm. Only when it was present. The past doesn't exist either. It's something in your mind. That's why you I'm can take trying. two, three, however many people, put them together, let them go through an event, and every one of them will tell a different story about that event. Mm -hmm. Because the past, that what they remember is based on their perception, not what actually happened. So we hold the memory of our perception, not the memory of what actually happened. Yeah. Okay. Right? And so, and then the depression, that's a past, that's a negative past-based uh, mindset. These are all thought patterns. So when we can learn to think more effectively, then we can feel better. Mm -hmm. Right? And so when we start making choices that are different, that align with our true values and our true desires and start to step into congruence with that, with well, an anxiety and depression, they start lessening. And before you know it, they can dissipate completely. I mean, you can get rid of, of debilitating anxiety. Now, there's a normal healthy level of anxiety, right? I mean, if you're in a dark alley and somebody starts chasing you, you're going to get anxious. You're going to go yeah. into a state of hypervigilance. And there's our, you know, the caveman mentality, right? That yeah. keeps us safe, right? It boosts the adrenaline, helps us, you know, uh, bring ourselves to a state of safety. But as humans, we can think something. We can think a thought of being unsafe, and it automatically takes us into that. But it's just a thought state, right? We're not living in times of survival, you mm -hmm. know, like we used to, not most of the time. Yeah. And so when we can start to learn how to regulate the thinking, well, our choices come from our thoughts. And if mm -hmm. we start making, uh, you know, creating more effective thinking, we start choosing more effectively, you can absolutely get rid of depression. Suicidal ideations, OCDs, uh, you know, debilitating anxieties, you can get rid of all of it. So when you look at it from that vantage point, this is how I've done it, right? This isn't, this isn't just a theory. 
this is practical. This is this is how I've healed myself. This is how you did it. When you, my understanding of depression, Mike, is it's the emotions that have been sort of stuffed down. They haven't been allowed to fully express. Is that a right thinking? Sure. Unresolved conflict, right? So okay. think about it like this. Uh, it's when when something, some kind of depression or some thought pattern, right? And we typically don't become aware of the thought state until after we feel mm. it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the emotions, their, their, their job is to bring in awareness, right? And the yes. reason it's there to bring in awareness is so that we can utilize that, you know, that God-given right to choose, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. how we use our free will is through awareness. The things you become aware of, you have choice over. Right. Whether you think you do or not, you have choice, not, not yeah. necessarily external choice. That doesn't mean yeah. you can just go change things outside of you. But that's not what free will is. Free is free will is not your ability to go do things, whatever you want in this world. You can't go do whatever you want in this world. Free will is a matter of exercising your ability to think in any direction that you want using the imagination so that you can then express yourself in any way that you want. Right. So free will is an internal thing, not an external thing. Mm -hmm. Right. We can make choices with the externals, but we can't choose what happens from those choices. Right. So <clears throat> the depression, you know, when when you've got a conflict in the subconscious mind, right, you went through an event, somebody did something to you. OK, mm -hmm. and your mind doesn't know how to handle that. It doesn't know what to do with it. Think about it as like mm -hmm. a like a loose end. Right. Yeah. It has no direction, doesn't know what to do. So now you have a conflict. You can go in, you can direct your mind, tell it what to do with that. And that will kind of close the gap. Mm -hmm. Right. But to do that, we have to change our association. It, it, it really comes from, you know, a victim mentality. Right. Somebody did something to me. Well, mm -hmm. we can look at it that way. I mean, and, and there's a lot of I guess there's a lot of benefit in being a victim. I'm not saying, you know, you can be a victim of something. But when you're when you have a victim mentality, that means you have no choice over what you do with it, right? I mean, even if you experience things in your life you don't prefer, with your power of choice, you can do with it what you prefer to do with it. Yeah. Right? And so it, you can create a gift out of it. Right. <laughs> but if we're looking in the past and we're seeing something, we say, oh, this was negative, right? This happened to me. This was negative. Well, that's a judgment, mm -hmm. right? Judgment doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, it's like when we say, oh, well, this shouldn't have happened. Well, if it did happen and we say that it shouldn't have happened, well, well we got some incongruence with, between reality yeah. and our idea. Well, which one's right? Reality. Reality is never wrong. So if we say, oh, it should have happened, but it didn't, well, then it shouldn't have happened because it didn't. That's reality. Okay. And we want to align our thinking with reality. It doesn't matter whether you think it should or whether you think it shouldn't. That's just a thought, right? Mm -hmm. What matters is what's real, what's happening, and what can we do with it? Okay. And so that depression, oh, I should have done it differently. Why? Why not do something productive with it now? What lessons can you draw from it? How can you use it to refine yourself? And so everything becomes a, a launch pad into a greater version of yourself. Well, then when you start to look at everything as a launch pad into a greater version of yourself, well, then what is there to be depressed about? <laughs> I just because feel now this it's only way. Helping you. <laughs> I just feel this way. And and. <laughs> And that's because we're absent minded of what's actually creating the feeling. And so we want to sit with the feeling. And the first thing we tend to try to do is get rid of the feeling. Well, why? Yes. Yeah. It's right? uncomfortable, I mean, isn't it? It's like pain. You don't want to sit with the pain. My yeah. Oh my goodness, we've gone down so many, so many rabbit holes. I want to bring it back to you help people with anxiety and depression. And I heard you say that it's um, a construct of, of how they are perceiving the world and they can change it by seeing themselves differently. And it sounds like that's a lot of, of work that the person needs to do. You also mentioned that they can see it as they have mental health issues. 
when they recognize they have mental health issues, is that they need to go seek some help externally? Uh, it depends. It depends on the person. You know, like um, I didn't necessarily seek help externally uh, for many years. And then I did. And then I realized and understood the value of such things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things we could do on our own because we live in the age of knowledge. And we, there's okay. so many things you can learn on your own. And and you, you've got to start there. I think, you know, your search has got to start with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like people that they're searching for their purpose. So many people are searching for their purpose. But if you want to live with purpose, you have to begin living on purpose. Mm -hmm. That's how you can find your purpose. Start living on purpose, on purpose. and that will lead you yeah. to your purpose. But, you know, there's a plethora of, you know, uh, resources online that, that you can begin there. You can, you know, read a book. But the first thing we have to do is we have to be open. We have to be open-minded. There's a lot of stigma about, you know, saying, oh, I have mental health issues. Look, you can live under that stigma and you can live in all this pain. And you mentioned, you know, it sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work, but it's more work living with those mental health issues for the rest of your life, that's going to, that, that is going to create much more work for you. Mm -hmm. And in the end result, you're going to wish you had done something, which is a good cause for regret. But, you know, start where you are. If, if you just need somebody, reach out, interview some people in your area or some, I mean, these days you don't have to be in your area. You can do it online. I work yeah. primarily online with people. Yeah. Um, you know, look into some resources, you know, get a sense of what resonates with you. Right. You know, because just going to somebody is not what you want to do. You want to make sure you're working with someone that you resonate with. This, yeah. I think, you know, this is where a lot of people, don't get the help that they need. And then the business of therapy, which has a very low success rate, traditional therapy, because people aren't matching themselves up with who they need to be with. They're just going mm -hmm. to a local counseling company and, and they think that that's what you do. It's not what you do. And it doesn't work that well for a lot of people when it's done that way. Interview these people, read about mm -hmm. them, go on the website, Look this person up. Do they have ideals and philosophies? Do they do they speak in ways that resonates with you? Mm -hmm. And your heart's going to tell you. You know, your heart's going to say, "Oh no, I feel at home with this person." That's yeah. where you want to go. And when you can find that, that's when you're going to get the help you need from that person. It's not just anybody because you, you know, going through school through psychology doesn't just you know. It teaches you foundational things. It doesn't teach you how to help people. You need to work with people or someone that, that you resonate with. That's so very important. And it's one of the reasons why when, when I work with people, I only work with people I feel I'm meant to serve. So I'm very selective because that's how I'm going to be effective. Yeah. Right. And 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 I tried, you know, just working with anyone who would come to my door. And that didn't work for me. Yeah. And that's not why I'm in this business. Yeah. Right. I want to work with the people I'm meant to serve. And so I have to let my heart guide me on that uh, mm -hmm. and my intuition. But you can start, you know, looking up information, start understanding mental health in a different way, be open to that, and, you know, get rid of the stigma. It's okay to have mental health issues. Most all people do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. It's it's not it's nothing new. It's, and it's becoming more normalized in society. Yeah. And I and I really, really like that because now people are starting to get help. Getting so the help that they, they need. Yeah. 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 There's a sure. lot of resources out there. You know, seeing someone in person is definitely an option. That's where you're probably going to get your most effective help. But, you know, things have to line up for that. I mean, you have to have the 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 time. You have to have financial resources. I mean, because things mm -hmm. like that cost money. I mean, yeah. some people are looking for a handout. You know, mm -hmm. they want free help. And free help, in my experience, 
isn't typically that effective because now the person doesn't have any skin in the game. So mm -hmm. if they don't show up to their sessions, well, they didn't lose anything. Mm -hmm. But now you throw some money in the mix there. And, and, you know, most people are like, you know, think of it as an expense. It's not an expense. It's an investment. Yes. And the greatest investment yeah. you'll ever make is in yourself. And so when you go and you get help, don't be afraid to pay some money because that's where you're going to get the most help. Mm -hmm. It just is. There, there's a psychology to money. And so, you know, and if you don't have the financial resources, I mean, there's all kinds of things out there. You can buy online programs. You can you can do small courses. You can watch YouTube channels. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many different things that you can do. I'm going to stop you there, Mike, because when you're depressed, it's hard to motivate yourself, isn't it? Yes, it is. You got to be ready. And, and if you're not ready to ask for help, you're typically not ready to receive it. Okay. But when that pain becomes so great that you can no longer stay the same, that's okay. typically when somebody you know reaches out and gets some help. Okay. So that's where yeah. they have to sort of get. I just wanted to, I mean, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, but not everybody's a go-getter. And we'll yeah. use the resources that we've got at our fingertips, uh, especially when you're in depression. It can yeah. slow. And the sad truth, process. though, is, you know, this is the hard truth. Nobody's going to do it for you. Yeah. Nobody's going to do it. And, you know, even I'm sure you feel like it sometimes. I feel like it sometimes. I would love to be able to do it for some people because they deserve it. They deserve it. Yeah. yeah. But you can't do it for them. They have to have the will and want to. Yeah, you can give them all the support and love and empathy, but they have to want to move from yep. why they came to visit you in the first place. Yes, they have to take those steps. It's just yeah. the way it is. It doesn't work any other way. It just doesn't. Yeah. So your book... Would that be a good place for people to sort of you who may be, you know, having some of the things we've discussed would be a good place to um, start? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I often talk about is knowledge. Knowledge mm -hmm. is power and knowledge about the self becomes self-empowerment. And so mm -hmm. what I do in my book is, is I break down the subconscious mind and the conscious mind, the, the, the parts, the moving pieces what they do, what they're responsible for. Uh, I talk about the stages of thought and, you know, the future and the past and where these emotional disturbances come from so we can gain a greater understanding of what it is we're even going through mm -hmm. and why we're going through it. There's the understanding. So we got the knowledge, we got the understanding, and then we bring in the practicality. That's where we bring in the tools to start working okay. these things out. Yeah. Yeah. So that'd be a great well, place to start. I'm glad I mentioned it. And your books are Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any bookstores. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Or even your own website. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, my goodness, what a conversation. I can't believe how quickly the time flew. And as you know, I prepare. I have 20 questions I haven't even touched. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's when we know it's right. It just, <laughs> it just flows. Sort of follow. It does indeed. I want to thank you so much for being here and thank you listeners uh, for joining us today. Do you have any final words you'd like to leave the listeners with, Mike? You know, life is tough sometimes. But don't ever forget that there's nothing you've been through, no matter how difficult no matter how strenuous, no matter how bad, no matter how tough, that you didn't have the power to make it through. You got this. Whether you believe it now, invest in yourself. Go learn. Life is a journey. It's a beautiful unfolding. If only we have the courage to find that beauty. Mm. So I encourage you to, to go out there and... Create a vision for yourself of a better life, of a better you, and go after it. Mm, beautiful. Thanks, Mike. 
Once again, appreciate you uh, reaching out. And I'm so grateful we have this chat. Until next time, listeners, I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.